they can turn bright blue skies dark as night. They can, in an instant, make entire cities disappear. They can crush the human spirit with unflinching indifference. They are natural disasters, unforgiving forces of nature that bend steel, smash concrete, and rip human bodies to shreds. Rampaging floods, roiling oceans, boiling mountains of lava. The beauty of nature can turn on a dime, creating some of the most horrific events ever recorded in human history. Names like Vesuvius, Galveston, even Hurricane Diane are tragic reminders of an unbridled power unleashed without warning. Destructive forces that can catch even the most wary souls off guard, wiping them from the face of the earth. These monstrous spectacles are at once mesmerizing and haunting. The visual record left in their wake is like none other. Now, using restored film footage and high-definition photography, we can dig deep beneath the madness and the rubble to explore what happens to cities, towns, and people when Mother Nature decides to let loose. San Francisco, California. The city by the bay. The crown jewel of American urban living. From cable cars to its famous Golden Gate Bridge, the city of San Francisco has captivated the world's imagination since it was founded more than 150 years ago. But San Francisco's rolling hills in this beautiful city were formed out of violence. Massive earthquakes that have ripped apart the landscape of California for tens of thousands of years. In April 1906, no one knew that one of those temblers was about to bring San Francisco to its knees. Tuesday, April 17th, 1906. It's the opening night of the Metropolitan Opera's stint at the Mission Opera House. Famed tenor Enrique Caruso sings the final notes of Carmen. Pleased with his performance, Caruso and the rest of the opera company go back to the Palace Hotel for the night. From the Victorian mansions on Knob Hill to the Conservatory of Flowers in Golden Gate Park. From Market Street to Chinatown, the city sleeps. Just a few miles to the west is a ticking time bomb, the San Andreas Fault. At 5.12 a.m., 19 minutes before sunrise on April 18th, the windows of Caruso's hotel room begin to rattle in their frames. San Francisco lies on the tip of a peninsula, surrounded by the San Francisco Bay on one side and the wide Pacific Ocean on the other. When Spanish explorer Don Gaspar de Portola arrives in 1769, 
he finds five towns populated by members of the Yuluma tribe. The Spanish explorers name the settlement Yerba Buena and establish a mission in 1776. It takes only two generations for the indigenous population to vanish. The city becomes a part of Mexico after the Mexican War of Independence in 1821, and Commodore John D. Sloat claims the city for the United States in 1846 during the Mexican-American War. While the city has always been known for its beautiful landscape and mild weather, these are not the forces driving its expansion in the second half of the 19th century. The rise of San Francisco can be summarized in one word, gold. The California gold rush brings an influx of fortune seekers, wishful thinkers, entrepreneurs, and con artists to the city. The population of San Francisco jumps from 1,000 in 1848 to 25,000 by the end of 1849. These people will come to be known as the 49ers, named after the year in which many of them arrive in California. On September 9, 1850, Congress votes to make California the 31st state. As dawn rises on April 18, 1906, San Franciscans have every reason to believe that theirs is a city on the rise. The city's population has grown to about 400,000, it has survived the boom and bust of the gold rush. It has survived the first outbreak of bubonic plague in North America. San Francisco is quickly becoming a world-class cosmopolitan city. But what an awakening, opera singer Enrico Caruso writes. I wake up about five o'clock feeling my bed rocking as though I am in a ship on the ocean. I get up and I go to the window, raise the shade and look out. I see the buildings toppling over, big pieces of masonry falling. And from the street below, I hear the cries and screams of men and women and children. William James, philosopher and brother of novelist Henry James, is in Stanford, several miles south of San Francisco. He describes the quake as shaking the room exactly like a terrier shakes a rat. The silence afterwards is soon filled with the soft babble of human voices as people walk out onto the street in their pajamas and assess the horrific damage. May 31st, 1889. Heavy rain has been falling in western Pennsylvania for days. The 30,000 residents of Johnstown go about their daily business. Theirs is a town that is one of the centers of the nation's steel production. The Little Conmaw River quietly rolls past the town of Johnstown, not even hinting at any danger. But 14 miles upriver, the decrepit South Fork Dam which is 930 feet across and 72 feet high, slowly springs a leak. Rising against the South Fork Dam is Lake Conemaugh, 
owned by the wealthy and exclusive South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, a resort destination for robber barons of the age, like Andrew Carnegie and Andrew Mellon. This is their personal playground. And though they may be geniuses at building businesses, doing maintenance on the dam that protects their cherished lake is very low on their priority list. The combination of heavy rain and poor maintenance proves too much for the dam. At 3.10 p.m. on May 31st, 1889, the South Fork Dam breaks wide open. 20 million tons of water rush out of the lake. The flood sweeps along the valley floor, picking up debris as it wipes out small towns along the way. 57 minutes after the dam crumbles, a 60-foot wall of water reaches Johnstown. The residents have almost no warning. Entire families are swept away along with their homes. No building, whether made of wood, brick, or stone, can stand up against a direct hit from the flood. But the destruction does not end there. As the first surge runs out of momentum, the water begins to return toward the dam, hitting Johnstown a second time, but from the opposite direction. As news of the disaster begins to trickle out, Clara Burton's recently founded Red Cross organization rushes to the scene. They find four square miles of Johnstown leveled. Some of the debris is so stubborn that dynamite must be used to clear it. Two thousand two hundred and nine people die. Up until that time, it is the largest loss of life in a natural disaster in the history of the United States. But the Johnstown flood will hold that morbid distinction for only 11 years. Because on September 1st, 1900, the U.S. Weather Bureau reports that a ferocious storm is forming southeast of Cuba and it is headed straight towards Galveston, Texas. Nestled along the southern shores of the Texas coast is another of the most storied cities in the United States, Galveston. The historic town lies across two islands in the Gulf of Mexico, about 50 miles southeast of Houston. It is known as the Playground of the South. And for good reason, Galveston is home to long beaches and warm Gulf Stream water. But there is something else about Galveston that catches the eye, something that speaks to a tragedy from the past while giving hope to the future. More than a century ago, this massive seawall 17 feet high and 10 miles long, was constructed in Galveston. A powerful gesture from the people of this island community that they were determined to continue living on their land and that the destruction caused by waves that once swallowed Galveston would never again drive them away. The idea for a seawall or some kind of breakwater system had been discussed prior to September 8, 1900. But up until that point, there was always an excuse why it had not been built, despite Galveston being the largest deep water port in the United States. 
Now, the 38,000 residents are about to find out what the consequences will be for their neglect. The denizens of Galveston have seen their share of storms before. So in early September 1900, no one is particularly alarmed when the Weather Bureau begins to send out warnings about a tropical storm forming near Cuba. But in the early morning hours of September 8th, residents wake up to 120 mile an hour winds buffeting their houses. When they look out their windows, instead of the streets they are used to seeing, they see four feet of surging water. A nearly 16 foot storm surge overtakes the islands. The city is leveled. More than 3,600 homes are destroyed. The storm surge knocking houses off their foundations and turning them into kindling wood. Anything and anyone in the storm's path is no more. In a letter, survivor Charles Law writes, on Sunday morning after the storm was all over, I went out into the streets. I gazed upon dead bodies lying here and there, the houses all blown to pieces, women, men, and children all walking in the streets in a weak condition with bleeding head and bodies and feet all torn to pieces with glass where they had been treading through the debris of fallen buildings. Mount Vesuvius hovers over Italy's Gulf of Naples like a cranky dragon. While its most famous eruption destroyed Pompeii in 79 AD, the volcano has threatened humans in the area since the Bronze Age. And it continues to be active to this day. Ancient Roman politician Pliny the Younger described the region at the foot of this monstrous Mediterranean volcano as the loveliest on all of the earth. Pliny lived through the destruction of Pompeii. He said the cloud of ash that destroyed the town was like an umbrella of pine, for it rose to a great height on a sort of trunk and then split off into branches. Mount Vesuvius erupts at least 38 more times over the next two millennia. Despite this violent history, the area's natural beauty never fails to draw locals and vacationers to all of the towns in the red zone. Ironically, it is the ash from the dangerous volcano that makes the soil perfect for local agriculture, including grape production. Sightseers come from all walks of life. In May 1938, just two months after Germany annexes Austria, Adolf Hitler's girlfriend, Eva Braun, visits the volcano. A decade later, Vesuvius once again erupts, sending a towering cloud of ash into the sky. Nearby villages, including San Sebastiano al Vesuvio, Massa di Soma, and Ottaviano are destroyed. In the streets, soldiers keep panicked citizens away from the slowly moving mass of molten rock. As the lava consumes each building, bit by bit, the structures explode in fire, sending huge plumes of smoke and volcanic ash billowing into the sky. Residents and soldiers stand helplessly by as the volcano advances. What had first seemed like a small piece of lava 
soon built into something more than two stories high. Building after building explodes and falls victim to the merciless monster of nature, a disaster in slow motion like none other. Residents witness the destruction of an entire town a few fleeting moments at a time. As the lava advances, civilians load their personal belongings into army trucks. And this being Italy, cases of bottles of wine. The citizens of San Sebastiano are at once mesmerized and horrified. Women and children stare in disbelief as their homes are slowly consumed by this monster. Everything in the lava's path is destroyed. Wood, stone, brick, nothing is spared. As they watch their town being gobbled up, the emotions of those left homeless pours out. There is nowhere for them to go. 26 Italian citizens are killed, and almost 12,000 are left homeless. The 340th Bomb Group of the U.S. Army Air Forces is stationed near Mount Vesuvius at Terzingo. Sergeant Robert F. McRae describes the sound of the eruption as like that of bowling balls slapping into the pins on a giant bowling alley. Nearly 80 U.S. bombers are damaged or destroyed by the suffocating layer of hot ash. Falling rocks tear holes in protective fabric of airplanes, smash through plexiglass cockpit windows, and wreck their wings. In the shadow of the Great Mountain, even the great machines of war are like toys. Nothing is, or ever will be, safe. It was the same type of geological shift that sets in motion the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. The epicenter of the quake is about two miles off the San Francisco coast, near a geological outcropping called Muscle Rock. While the 1906 earthquake is the largest in many years, it is not the first for San Francisco. Leading up to then, the area had been punctuated by minor quakes. It is possible that the increased activity is, like much of San Francisco's history to this point, related to gold. Hydraulic mining near fault lines during the gold rush may have contributed to the string of earthquakes. While the major earthquake itself lasts for only about 42 seconds, the destruction is just beginning. Ruptured gas lines cause over 35 fires, which burn for days. The fires are exacerbated by firemen misusing dynamite to try and create fire breaks as well as by property owners who set fire to their homes and businesses after being told they will not receive insurance compensation for earthquake damage unless there is fire damage as well. William James says that with the streets lighted only by conflagration, it was apprehended that the criminals of San Francisco would hold high carnival on the ensuing night. Soldiers are called in from nearby army bases and are given instructions to shoot looters on sight, an order that is complicated by the fact that some of the soldiers themselves participate in the looting.
When the smoke finally clears, 3,000 people have lost their lives. 28,000 buildings have been destroyed. Between half and three quarters of the city's 410,000 residents have lost their homes. Many stay in tent cities and refugee camps, some for more than two years. The Army builds 5,610 relief houses. Other people simply leave the city and never return. Leaving an area because of the disasters brought by Mother Nature seems to have little or no effect with those living in the danger zones along beautiful coastlines. The North Atlantic in late summer. It is at times a gently rolling sea of blue-gray peaks and valleys. The mountains of crashing surf along the eastern seaboard of the United States are filled with both majesty and immeasurable power. But its sublime beauty is a double-edged sword. This stretch of massive oceanfront from Florida north to New England is often visited by a witch's brew of violent massive storms that sometimes take days to form thousands of miles away and sometimes appear without warning overnight. Though residents of this remarkable stretch of coastline have grown accustomed to being battered by storms, few people realize in August 1955 that one of the most unpredictable and deadly hurricanes the region has ever seen is barreling down on them. On August 15th, news services up and down the eastern seaboard report about a storm headed toward the North Carolina coast. As with all other hurricanes, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration gives this one a name, Hurricane Diane. It's bad news for the residents of North Carolina. They have just begun to recover from Hurricane Connie, which had roared through the state just days earlier. But mercifully, Hurricane Diane passes through the state and does little damage. Diane is downgraded to a tropical storm and it moves north along the East Coast. The Weather Bureau's report for New England that night is partly cloudy with a chance of showers and scattered thunderstorms. Residents of the region breathe a sigh of relief as they head to bed on the evening of August 17th. But later that night, rain begins to fall and fall, and fall. Nearly 20 inches worth. What was believed to have been a passing rainstorm has turned into a tidal wave unleashed by the sky. During the early morning hours, it is obvious that the deluge that was Hurricane Diane is not yet finished with the eastern seaboard of the United States. The storm levels some of its most devastating damage in eastern Pennsylvania. More than 20 inches of water comes down in a short period of time, causing the worst flooding in the region on record. The areas in and around Strasburg, Pennsylvania, feel the worst of Diane's wrath. Rushing waters demolish about 150 road and railway bridges. Trains are stopped dead in their tracks or washed into rivers. Massive pressure built up from a never-before-seen amount of rain either breaches or completely destroys 30 dams, sending killer floods thundering down mountain passes and sweeping away everything in their wake. 
Flooding covers two-thirds of the state of Connecticut, much of southern Massachusetts, from its border with the state of New York to the Atlantic Ocean is flooded. Rescue operations are in full force, but hampered not only by rapidly rising waters, but mountains of debris that roil in the raging floods. Throughout New England, more than 200 dams are destroyed. In the Massachusetts town of Southbridge, all hell breaks loose. Houses are tossed about like toys. Pictures from the city show the wooden timbers from buildings snapped like twigs. In its wake, the flood leaves 10-foot blankets of mud inside homes and businesses, like this W.T. Grant department store. It will take weeks for workers using their hands, shovels, and wheelbarrows to remove the debris. In some places ravaged by the flood, there is no debris, only the foundation of what was once rows of houses. Tens of thousands of people are now homeless and sift through the silt and watery soot desperate to find anything they can salvage from their destroyed lives. Earth moving equipment is brought in. With so many people killed, cleanup crews are forced to wear hazmat gear to protect themselves from the unseen dangers that hover in the putrid air. Teams of volunteers strap on tanks filled with toxic chemicals in a somewhat futile effort to prevent the spread of disease. U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower arrives to get a first-hand look at the devastation. Hastily built Bailey Bridges Temporary structures designed simply to get communities moving again are constructed by the hundreds. Drinking water is at a premium. And the U.S. military becomes an instrumental part of breathing life back into storm-damaged cities and towns. President Eisenhower declares parts of New England disaster areas. When the rain finally stops, 90 people are dead, and $540 million worth of damage must be accounted for. The cost of the damages exceeds several states' revenues for that year. The horrific event comes to be known by locals as Black Friday. Across the treacherous Atlantic Ocean, from the towns hit by Black Friday, is another natural disaster with a color denomination. 
the White Death. Many people call the snow-daubed mountains of the Alps home. Many others visit every year, drawn to the area for the skiing or the hiking or the striking beauty of its peaks. But these mountains and the snow that adorns them holds a violent power that can turn a drowsy mountain village into a surging, suffocating sea of snow. They are avalanches. An avalanche can reach speeds of 80 miles per hour only seconds after it has been triggered. For a person caught in an avalanche, there is always a risk of being struck by debris. But by far the highest risk to humans in an avalanche is being buried alive and suffocating. January in the Austrian Alps is cold and quiet. The days are short and the snow is heavy. The popular skiing destination of Damules in the extreme west of the country boasts the most annual snowfall of any village in the entire Alps, more than 30 feet a year. Only 15 miles away from Damules is the tiny town of Blanc's, Population 365. 1953, late autumn in Western Austria is unusually mild. Flowers still bloom in December and the first snow doesn't fall until Christmas Eve. But the residents of Blanc's know that the weather in their town can change in an instant. On January 9, 1954, a blizzard begins. Over the next three days, up to six and a half feet of snow covers the mountain towns of Western Austria and Northeastern Switzerland. On the morning of January 11, an announcement on a local radio station says, the danger of avalanches has become extremely serious. Just before 10 a.m., the first avalanche hits Blanc. Eighty-two people are buried alive. Thirty-four die. But the disaster that will come to be known as the White Death is just beginning. As survivors struggle to free trapped family members and neighbors, Another avalanche sweeps through the town. The second avalanche wipes out the first wave of rescuers. The snow rumbles to a stop. Silence engulfs the entire village. Later estimates of the number of dead and missing range from 79 to 111, between 20 and 30 percent of the population of Blanc. Blanc is hit the worst, but it is not the only town that is hit. 388 avalanches are reported over the next 48 hours in Austria, Switzerland, and Germany at least 200 more people die. With phone lines down because of the blizzard, helicopters are the only means of communication. News doesn't reach the outside world for more than a day. An international team of rescuers arrives on January 13th. Swiss and US soldiers in the area rush to the scene. Helicopters are loaded with supplies. Highly trained rescue dogs also board the helicopters on their way to sniff out victims. Shovels are given to rescuers as they begin to dig. Some wear skis and are sent farther into the mountains to search for survivors. 
but the rescue operation itself is not without its dangers. Despite careful planning and mapping out of the routes, many of those who try to help end up joining the ranks of the dead and the missing. Entire houses are buried. Trains have been thrown from their tracks. Rescuers use every method available, from trucks to tanks to tractors to horse-drawn sleighs, in order to reach survivors before they suffocate beneath tons of snow. Many people are dug out and rescued. Many others are never found. Survivors and dead alike are dragged away from the destruction zone on sleds. Those in the most critical condition are airlifted from the scene. When space is limited, rescuers improvise. They even strap some survivors to the roofs of military vehicles in order to get them to hospitals as quickly as possible. Since the avalanche, the town of Blanc has been rebuilt, but etched in its history is this day in 1954 when the town was put on the map and nearly wiped from it. In 1900, in Galveston, Texas, just getting someone outside the city to realize that Galveston is a disaster area is a challenge because the massive storm that came through here has destroyed all bridges to the mainland, along with the city's telegraph lines, so that no word of what has happened in Galveston can be relayed to the outside world. It takes a full day before one of the few ships in Galveston Harbor that survived the storm to travel across the bay to Texas City and relay a message that Galveston is in ruins. When rescue workers finally arrive, they find the dead are everywhere. Estimates range from 6,000 to 12,000 people are killed. No one knows the exact number for sure. Most of the dead had drowned or been crushed in floating islands of debris that circled in the thrashing sea. At least 30,000 people are left homeless. It's said that many survived the storm, but they die after being trapped in wreckage for days. Horrifically, rescuers report that as they walk on mountains of shattered homes looking for survivors, they can hear the screams of those buried alive beneath their feet. The bodies are so numerous that burying all of them is impossible. The dead were initially weighted down on barges and dumped at sea. But when the Gulf currents wash many of the bodies back onto the beach, something else has to be done. Massive funeral pyres are set up along the coast or wherever dead bodies are found. The corpses burn day and night for several weeks after the storm. City officials pass out free whiskey to sustain the distraught men who are conscripted to do the gruesome task of gathering and burning the dead. Even for veterans of the U.S. Civil War living in Galveston, these scenes of horror far exceed anything they had witnessed during the bloody war between the states. The residents of Galveston vow this will never happen again. The city builds a living monument to those killed, a seawall that remembers what happened and protects those who remain. Not only is there now a 17-foot-tall wall, 10 miles long, but 14 million cubic feet of sand is used to raise the level of the island by 10 feet.
Galveston today remains one of the shining examples of a coastal city that met the ocean head on and eventually won. But the devastation caused that horrible day in the year 1900 remains the deadliest natural disaster in U.S. history. But if Galveston is the most deadly of these natural disasters, it is the San Francisco earthquake of 1906 that remains the most famous. Following the Tembler and engulfing fire, the city by the bay is nearly wiped off the peninsula. The mansions in the wealthy neighborhood of Knob Hill are completely destroyed resulting in the development of the neighborhood now called Pacific Heights. Following the quake, people begin to return to their houses looking for survivors or family relics. Many of the buildings that house public services are destroyed, so temporary locations must be set up. Hospitals, post offices, and distribution centers for food and clothing are hastily arranged. People gather in the streets to cook meals amidst the rubble. The petty crime that reigns in the early days following the San Francisco earthquake is replaced by the desire to provide aid and to rebuild. When William James returns to the city eight days later, he writes, the fire was out and about a quarter of the area stood unconsumed. Sheds were already going up as temporary starting points of businesses. The cheerfulness, or at any rate, the steadfastness of tone was universal. There was a temper of helpfulness beyond the counting. Donations flow in. Andrew Carnegie gives $100,000. Standard Oil also gives $100,000. The United States government votes to send the city $1 million. But these donations are actually a drop in the bucket. The damage caused by the San Francisco earthquake is estimated at the time to be more than $400 million or about $6.2 billion in today's money. Novelist H.G. Wells is in New York City when news of the earthquake arrives. He is surprised by the reaction. No one is in the least degree dismayed, he writes. There is no doubt anywhere that San Francisco can be rebuilt larger better, and soon. In 1909, the city celebrates the construction of 20,000 new buildings during the Portola Festival. By 1915, San Francisco is ready to host the Panama Pacific International Exposition, a World's Fair designed to celebrate the opening of the Panama Canal. The city's flag, which was adopted around the year 1900, proves to be prophetic. It is a phoenix rising from the flames. During an age when man believed to be a captain of his own universe, natural disasters were a sobering reminder that the world can be forever changed in an instant. Dreams destroyed, homes wiped from the face of the earth, lives tragically cut short, people who were in the wrong place at the wrong time and never had a chance. These are the stories that tear at the heart. The narratives of natural disasters bring with them wrenching sadness, overwhelming grief, and stunning reminders that we are all at the mercy of forces well beyond our control. The images from these moments return us to a time of lost innocence, to places that no longer exist, and to the faces of those who had no choice but to stare down the devil and somehow manage to survive.